I just want to tell you the background of how this came about. Uh, uh, John Osowski, John was always talking about everything that we have in this jewel uh, upstairs and he probably knew most of what was in here. Well, this summer we got together and decided that we all want to know what's in here and what shouldn't be. And as we started going through uh, books and posters and you name it, dolls, whatever, different artifacts, we found some things that were going together. So some of the things that you see around the room that seem to go together, they go together now, but God knew where they were to begin with because they were just in different places. And uh, to go along with that, that's how my part of the program uh, came along. And one of the jewels that we found were these, not colorful now, but at one time, very colorful uh, uh, posters. And because of the costumes that were in it, and the very slight, down in the right uh, corner, name of the artist, I started to look around for information about the artist. And as we looked around, we then found that the tapestry that's on the wall, and you'll see it when you get up and are walking around, Valerie's over there now, but there's a frame on each side that represents a postage stamp that was also created in honor of this artist. There is a special technique of art made with uh, straw, colored straw and materials. There are two dancers in frames that were all done on the style of the artist. Those aren't marked. But this artist impacted uh, a lot of Polish art, and I'm going to tell you a story about her, but I, if you're, I hope that you do not mind listening, because I could put it into a small um, paragraph, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't do the artist justice. Her name is uh, Zasha Stryenska, and this is her picture. Did you say Zasha? Zasha Stryanska. And when I saw the picture, it kind of struck me as dark and moody. You know how you make that first impression sometimes of a person you meet? Well, this is how I met her with this picture. And I wanted to know more about her, who she was, how old she might have been in this picture, and a little bit more about her. I found a wonderful site called culture.pl. And if you go to Facebook or to the website web and plug that in, uh, they do send out a newsletter and it has all kinds of things that are part of the, uh, uh, that, that um, uh, allude to Polish culture. The article that I met her through is called Artist Mother Man, the Diaries of um, Zasha Stryanska. She started a diary when she was a young girl and she continued it for a long time. And this is how we know so much about her. Uh, when she did, uh, she was uh, probably in her late uh, 40s when she stopped writing in her diary. So after that, her, the life, her life uh, does not have a lot uh, that we don't know a lot about. Her art is still available. It's for sale on auctions. You can buy a piece of her art. You can see more of her art that is uh, known by its uh, costumes. She loved activity. She loved um, the dances. Uh, some of her artwork has details in it that are written out to tell 
the Polish names of parts of the costumes. And um, this is a little bit more about her. She actually was one of the most important Art Deco artists of the interwar period. She struggled to be the artist she wanted to be. She started at a very young age to draw. And her dad was a wise man who capitalized on this interest and took her many places. And a lot of her impressions about the kind of art she wanted to do or what she didn't like was actually uh, fabricated based on, based on, on those walks. Um, a lot of her art, uh, or excuse me, a lot of her diary uh, was written very carefully and it shows that her thoughts and feelings revealed family strife, money problems, and what happened when she pretended to be a man. Despite the fact that she lived about 100 years ago, she would become a woman whose problems would feel very modern. She'd have to balance work, children, struggle financially, and get divorced twice, common issues in the 21st century. Most of all, her diaries reveal, although she had great talent, she was also the queen of exaggeration, hysteria, jealousy, and fury. Uh, I don't know if you would remember, if any of you saw uh, Gwyneth Paltrow in Shakespeare in Love, and she actually disguised herself as a man to be able to play in the English Renaissance uh, theater. And uh, there are more heroines, heroines like that. Um, uh, Sarah Edmonds did it during the American Civil War, Charlotte Bronte. And even J.K. Rowling chose to have uh, her, their gender, her gender hidden as, as an author. Well, Poland was no exception. In 1907, I'm not sure if I mentioned, uh, uh, Zasha was born in 1894, and she died in 1976. Uh, in 1907, there was a poet, Maria Komornica, that's my version. Um, uh, burnt her dresses and took on uh, a man's name. And what she wanted to do was to um, make people aware that uh, she wasn't limited by her womanhood. The fact that she could act parts that, uh, that, that, she, w that she could adapt to. So it was kind of the, the first wave of of, of feminist uh, that was happening in, uh, in Poland. Now, this artist did a masquerade, but she did it because she wanted to get in an art academy. And she did it by dressing as a boy, but first to take the entry, entry exams. She did the entry exams, but as far as filling out the census that you do when the application, she used all of her brother's information. She made up a name. She went to the academy and she actually was there for about a year. And there were rumblings about her and when she felt that people were getting suspicious of her, she left the academy, but she did uh, survive the year. And this was one reason that she decided to do this. She wrote this in her diary and it was about her siblings. Stephus graduated from music school and started earning m money playing in the orchestra and in church choirs. Marilla and Yanka remained at school and I shaved my head bald and in Taju's clothes and with his documents, I enrolled to the Fine Art Academy in Munich since this was the school considered the best and most challenging of all. My masquerade was inevitable since women were not allowed at the Munich Academy nor in other universities. But this wasn't entirely true uh, because women could study in Warsaw at this point. But while in Krakow, uh, uh, Zasha was studying at a, a private fine arts uh, school. And with, um, by changing her identity, she then became labeled kind of a revolutionary and she was ready to do anything. Uh, in the 
archives of the Munich Academy, in this article there is a group picture and I'll leave it here so you can take a look and uh, her, her picture is uh, dressed as a young man. She's the third person from the left. Now, in another article, I found out that uh, just as Poland was gaining its uh, independent, independence and coming back to life, it was uh, Sasha's generation that was really looking to make its voice heard. I think kind of what we're going, what we see going on in our uh, our own days with the young people uh, speaking up about uh, uh, different concerns they have about uh, problems that we're having around the world. Um, what impacted Zusha's artwork uh, was the costumes, especially the area of the Tatra Mountains. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. And um, which I happen to be the Goral, Goralas, Goral, Goral, and uh, to this day. Now, this article, these are one. The first article was written in 2018. And this article was written in 2015. So we're not talking about material about this artist that is, you know, kind of hidden away or anything. And Tom, you said the, the book that's on Amazon that's about her with all of her artwork. Is that a newer book? It was published last year, not uh, 18, 2018. Uh -huh. And the title is just Stray and Scott. Yeah. That's it. And hopefully we'll, we'll get a copy of that. Uh, to have on as, as part of our artist exhibit. Uh, one of the other things um, that um, uh, it says uh, that, and I didn't know this, but apparently they're known for their fabrics, their weaving and bright colors, the Goralis people, but there are other groups. And the Hutzels, the Boikas, and Lemkos, now, Lemkos is a new word that I learned this summer at a Pisanki retreat because they have a, their own style of, uh, of writing Pisanki, which is very interesting. And a lot of that artwork is very similar to American, uh, Native American uh, Indians, or Natives, I should say. So, um, she had, she actually, started a series that was created that was based on folk tales and she got started by actually drawing on paper on cardboard boxes and um, the this series was a, a group of, of folk tales that the artwork was based on and when she was 21 she presented that artwork to the Friends of the Fine Arts and people purchased them immediately. So as she continued, she created different series. Uh, she was known as working in different uh, mediums. In 1917, she created a, a series where she actually portrayed Jesus and his disciples as poles surrounded by soldiers in uh, the Prussian Piklaub. P-I-K-I-E-L-H-A-U-B-E. Sorry for that. Um, the um, imagery where Jesus was symbolized by Poland corresponded to the messianic mode of thinking in the Romantic period. Uh, needless to say, she had a tumultuous life. Uh, she was um, a baptized Catholic. She was not the, uh, in really favor with the Catholic Church because of her uh, divorces, but she did still hold, to a, hold on to a Christian faith, though she was very interested in very old Slavic traditions, and much of her art uh, is based on the seasons, and um, where are you, Tom? Is Tom still around? No? Okay. Uh, we were talking about uh, these prints over here 
And although uh, uh, her name being Polish is on, is on there, and there is Polish at the top, the Costume Pesam Pologne is French. And we feel that these were part of a collection that were probably made for uh, an exhibit in, during the um, Olympics in France, although what I read was a series of 12 of these. Um, she died in 1976 alone, uh, and um, I'm still learning about her, but I wanted to share what I learned about her. I have a little pamphlet as part of our exhibit, and I would also at this time like to tell you the Who Was Kopernik and membership banners were uh, purchased by the Copernic organization with a match matching grant from the American Council of Polish Arts. And we're very proud of that. We uh, premiered them at the Copernic Park this summer at one of the, the um, uh, concerts. Uh, thank you for listening. And um, when we do this again, hopefully I'll know a little bit more about the lady. And if you'd like to find out the pamphlet that I have for you has her name and a little bit of information. So on display are these prints, the tapestry, the stamps, and the two pictures. And those pictures are probably my favorite because of the way that layered straw when you see it. Um, so thank you very much.